It's about time we talked about books. Lately, with all the manga read-through reviews that I've been doing, I haven't had a whole lot of time to talk about, like, just books. I'm just so busy doing that that I don't ever get to do this. On top of that, even, like, the big, famous booktubers always complain about how, oh, I make a book review and nobody watches it. So if the big guys can't get anyone to watch a book review, I really can't get anybody to watch one. But one of the main reasons why I started this channel was so I could talk about books. So when I go long extended periods of time without talking about them, I start to get really sad. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to talk about every book that I've read this year, which actually is lower than it should be. But like I said, I've also been really heavy into that manga. But anyway, we're going to do like a rapid review style situation where I just go through every single one of them. Some I might have a lot to say about them. Some I might have very little. I will attempt to, <laughs> I will attempt to give an actual legitimate rating to every single one of them. And it'll be kind of like rapid reviews of everything that I've read. This is everything that I've read. Here is a list of everything that I've read. I'm going to attempt to put timestamps on the bottom for the first time ever just in case you want to jump through and you don't want to see every single review. I mean, of course, you're welcome to watch them all, but just in case you didn't want to and you wanted to kind of zip to the book that you were interested in, the option is open to you. Anyway, starting with, let's move those down. Starting in chronological order of the books that I have read this year, we started the year off with our Friends from Frolics 8, by my man, Philip K. Dick. And if you have watched any of my previous book videos of any kind, you know that I am a huge fan of Philip K. Dick. Now this one, I don't think this gets enough love, to be quite honest. I think this is one of his lesser known ones. No one really talks about it. It is different, to say the least. And I thought it was actually fascinating. There is this kind of, this idea of old men and new men, old men being us, normal people, and new men being like the next stage in our evolution. Uh, they're smarter, they're better, and of course it being a Philip K. Dick book, this causes a divide in humanity, a divide in upper and lower social classes, the lower social classes being stepped on by the man being the new men. It causes that strict divide. There's also like a third class of, are they the precogs? Oh my gosh. So you have like the new men, the intellectually advanced, the precogs or the telekinetics, basically people with powers as per usual dick. And they are the ruling class. Then you have the old men or the normal people, and they are the underclass. And they are really looked down upon and stepped upon by the upper class. And the conversations that he sets up and is allowed to explore in this book are just as poignant as any other conversation that he tends to bring up. Actually, it's a conversation he tends to try and find a lot of different ways to discuss as usual, and he does just as good a job as any with this one. I thought this one was actually quite nice, and I'm shocked that it's not talked about as much as it is. It's not like the greatest dick book you're ever going to read, but it was quite good. And we have this character, this man has gone out to space, and he's on his way back to Earth with our friend from Frolics 8. And he is an alien, and he is supposed to solve the problems for the old men, the men that are oppressed and stepped upon. And when this alien gets to Earth, he's going to change things, um, and he it will affect things moving forward. This friend from Frolics 8, what is he? How does he function? Is he a typical alien in a typical science fiction book? No, oh, he is quite different. I was like, oh, this is very different as you're reading him. Then... When he gets here, he definitely is going to change things. But how? Mm, I'm not going to tell you. And is he changing things for the better? Time will tell. Um, it's drastic. It's dramatic. And it kind of just, he it just shit happens towards the end. And then it just kind of leaves you there. 
to think about the implications of the world that he has created and to think about the consequences and what's going to happen in the aftermath of the events of this book. He doesn't contemplate that for you. He just allows it to hang in the air, poses the questions for you to think about, and then he just kind of and walks away and I love it I love that approach to storytelling I love that he just kind of builds this world sets it up poses all of the questions to you but doesn't really ruminate on any answers he just kind of dips out and it's great I would say like I said it's not the greatest dick book ever written I would say it's probably I will give this one a solid 7.5 that's actually kind of low on dick standards, but I'd say it's fair. Also, can we just appreciate how awesome this cover is? I think we can. Book number two, The King in Yellow. This is fantastic. This is, I didn't even know that this was a thing or this was a guy that wrote stories. This is a book of short stories by an author named Robert Chambers. He's an author from the 1800s who wrote short stories. His short stories are what inspired H.P. Lovecraft to start writing his short stories. H.P. Lovecraft has even written short stories in the world of The King in Yellow, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think. Anyway, there is nothing in common with any of these short stories other than the fact that at some point in time, The King in Yellow is a part of the story. The, the King in Yellow is a play, but it's a play in like book form. And if you get the book of the play and you read it, you go insane. And that's it. So there's oftentimes a character in the story you're reading this story. It seems relatively normal, has nothing to do with anything else. And then a character pops up and they've got the King in Yellow and you're like, uh-oh, this isn't going to end well. And it's for the time, for being written in the 1800s, it is extremely accessible as far as readability and prose, and it's quite nice. There's one, there's one that takes place in the future, you know, of, of like 1920. So for him, that's, you know, I don't know, what was that, 40 years in the future or something like that. So he's like writing these futuristic, but in the future of 1920, and you're like, that's the future. And when New York City has gotten its shit together or come to its senses, I forget how he words it, and prioritized parks and knocked down all the buildings so they're short instead of tall, I forget. But I was fascinated. I was riveted. Start to finish, this is a wonderful book. Some of the stories are better than others. Some of them you're like, yeah, let's... Let's hurry up and get through this. Other ones are just phenomenal. I think the very first story, I think it's probably the most famous, and it is The Repairer of Reputations, was phenomenal. What a hook for a book. I couldn't stop with that one. That was great. And then In the Court of the Dragon was a really good one, too. It was just wonderful. If you are a fan of short stories that are loosely interconnected with some odd, creepy, underlying, supernatural feeling stuff, or if you're just a fan of H.P. Lovecraft in general, I can't recommend The King in Yellow enough. It's got a weirdly unsettling feel to it as you read through it. And even the more mild, normal love stories, once you've gotten through the first couple and you see that golden thread of the, the, the king in yellow and the madness that runs through these people, it then just kind of puts you on edge for the rest of it, even though there's really nothing cr truly creepy happening. It just kind of makes you uneasy as you go. Wonderful book. Wonderful stories. I loved every second of reading this one. Um, eight. Next up, A Canticle for Leibowitz. This is a Hugo Award-winning novel from 19-something. I love science fiction, therefore I love Hugo-winning books. A Canticle for Leibowitz is a wonderful little book. It's a wonderful little read. And for as much fun as I had reading this, and as good of a book as this genuinely is, I have surprisingly little to say about it. It is a post-apocalyptic future after everything's been destroyed and knowledge is forbidden. 
So this guy is going to basically form a monastery in the middle of nowhere and try to save books of knowledge for the future, for a time when mankind is ready to rediscover knowledge. He's going to hold it sacred and he's going to protect it. And that's just the first chunk of the book. Then the second chunk moves forward like a thousand years and shows that kind of like the rediscovery of these manuscripts and what we're going to do with them. And then we jump forward a thousand years again. So it's three completely separate self-contained stories and it's really wonderful. It's a good read, but I don't have anything massive to say about it. And I recommend you to pick it up, but it wasn't so sweeping that I was stuck thinking about it for weeks afterwards. I had a good time with it when I was reading it, and I promptly moved on from it. And that's not a scathing thing to say, but some, but I feel like some books kind of grab you and just kind of stick with you, and that wasn't, that wasn't my experience with this one. I think I'll give this one a seven. Definitely above average read. No! What did I read next? Annihilation. Okay, now, I'm going to rate these separately as three different books, of course, because they are three different books, but I have the, like, this edition, where they all th they, where it, they put them all together in one volume. If you've seen Annihilation, the Netflix original movie, then you have a very good idea of what the Area X trilogy is kind of about. And in this one, boy, what a hook for a trilogy. This is great. Annihilation was a really good book. I thought the movie was fine. Um, I didn't, like, it wasn't like, oh, I'm just drooling over this movie. I thought the movie was fine. It was a good movie. But the book was better. I know it's such a cliche thing to say the book was better, but it really was. In this case, the book was a lot better than that movie was. I liked the book. I liked the feel of the book. I liked the the vibe there is such a vibe to reading this world that they're in and the book is a little bit different than the movie is in the movies like get to the lighthouse and then the lighthouse is the place and you are done it's like you start in one spot there's a whole other place in the book that is way more important than the lighthouse and it's just not in the movie, like, at all. It's really strange. Like, it's, it, it, there are these two places inside of Area X that are very important. One is the lighthouse, and one is this other place. And the, uh, it's not in the movie. It's really weird. But I thought the first book was great. Easily an 8 out of 10 for me. I mean, it was just a really good read. It was a great hook. It was a great setup. I was so... So excited to move forward with this series with how good the first book was. Also, the first book is written in journal entries. It's like you're not really there. You're seeing this after the fact, and you're reading it through somebody's journal entries that have been found later. So it's not really, it's like first person, but it's not first person, but it's like these journal entries, but it's so... As always, when it comes to a book written through journal entries, you always have that lingering question in the back of your mind, how reliable is the narrator even? Because this isn't happening now. This already happened. And now that person is going to go back and write it down for us. And what are the details that they have embellished or maybe removed? Or it's such a fascinating read. I'm going to give it an 8.5. Like, it was exceptionally good. Now, book two. We enter a whole new situation with a whole new character. And now we're going to follow somebody different, which is a gamble. It's a roll of the dice. Now, you've taken the character that we liked, and they're not here anymore. You've taken a format that I liked, which is the journal entries, and that's gone, and now we're going to do a much more straightforward story with a whole new character. You are taking a chance that your audience is going to follow you on this new path to this new book, to this new journey. And I say that gamble worked because... I liked, I liked it. I liked the new character. I liked the new story. He is now 
this kind of like investigator trying to figure out what happened. And he's investigating Area X. He's investigating the character from the first book. And we kind of have that character in the background of book two, but they're not a focus. Our focus is now over here on this man named Control. And I thought that book two was almost as good as book one. I can only kind of compare it to like, say, Hyperion, where Hyperion set up a way of telling a story with book one and then deviated for book two to focus on a new character and a new style of writing. And it felt like a huge step down. Whereas this one sets up a certain style of storytelling in book one and then completely deviates from that to focus on a new style of storytelling with a new main character. And while this one wasn't maybe as great as the first one, it wasn't as huge of a drop in quality as Hyperion was. I know people disagree with that. Oh, the Hyperion books were great. Get the f*** out of here. Anyway, especially Endemion. The Endemion books were garbage. I actually, the one and only rant video I ever put on this channel had to do with one of the Endemion books. But anyway, it was good. If I gave the first one an 8.5, I'd probably give the second one an 8. Now, book three, Acceptance. Oh, no. I loved this. I loved this series so much. And then acceptance happened. What the hell was that? It meandered. It went in circles. It went nowhere. And then it ended. I was so disappointed. I thought I was really, really, really happy with the first two entries. And it wasn't bad, but goodness gracious it was not up to par with the other ones and if you were going to give me a mystery that wasn't solved there are ways to do that one of my favorite authors ever is Haruki Murakami and he writes mysteries within mysteries that don't give you any answers and he is one of the most frustrating authors for some people to read and I love him but this wasn't even that if you're gonna do that there are ways to do it. And this wasn't it. This literally felt like the first and the second one set everything up so well to just for this world I loved. For the third one to literally just kind of talk in circles and I just kept waiting for it to go somewhere or to say something or to do something or to do anything. Provide me with something meat to chew on to enjoy my read and it meandered and then it just stopped and I was like that that's it anyway whatever I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna be nice and I'm gonna give it a six which compared to the other books isn't great um yeah sorry Jeff you didn't stick the landing never let me go by Kazuo Ishiguro. Last year was the first time ever that I decided I wanted to read Kazuo Ishiguro. Kazuo Ishiguro is a Nobel Prize winning author. I have never in my entire life read a Nobel Prize winning author. So last year I picked up Clara and the Sun and I read it. It is phenomenal. It is a wonderful book. I have a video up on the channel about it. And I started the year off last year with Claire and the Sun in January. It wasn't my first read, but it was one of my first reads. So this year, I thought, why not early in the year? Let's do another one. Let's grab Never Let Me Go. Oh, he doesn't disappoint. Holy crap, does he not disappoint. There is a reason why Kazuo has a Nobel Prize. He writes stories that are just so poignant, and they just kind of touch you. He writes, these are science fiction books. These are the only two science fiction books that he's written. He's written some period pieces. He's written some stories written in the present day. And he's written some science fiction. Although I dare say this is hardly science fiction. It's not really your typical science fiction at all. And 
If you're into science fiction, like a big, big, big science fiction fan, science fiction is normally about ideas. It's really an ideas engine. And this isn't that. That's not the kind of science fiction that this is. These are deeply personal stories, and he's using science fiction as a way to tell personal stories about people and emotions and connection and the emotional attachments that people have to each other and how those develop and evolve over time and how those affect people over time and how people connect and then drift apart and then maybe reconnect or not. It's not typical for a science fiction book to, to be written in the way that he writes these. Now, these stories could be categorized as boring. Not a lot happens as far as his plot is concerned. Both this and Claire and the Sun, they're not plot-heavy books. I mean, this could the whole first half of this could be like, some kids went to boarding school and did some shit. Um, you know, like, but I'm being for real. And then the second half of the book is like, after they graduated, they did some more shit. Super not plot driven. Super not um, crazy over the top with its big bombastic action or ideas. It's just a slow contemplation on the human condition and what it means to be human and how the humans in the story connect to each other over long periods of time. And in his writing, in the way that he writes, he's so conscious of what he's doing and what he's trying to do with the story um, that he never loses sight or focus on this one minute detail of what it feels like to be these people and or what they are experiencing. It's simply astounding how he pulls it together. I don't know. I think he pretty much does the same thing in his old timey period pieces all the way up through his science fiction. He just kind of has this laser focus on the human condition. Anyway, Kazuo's kind of like the man. And I would give that one a 9 out of 10. Now, his dark materials. This is another trilogy in one book. This is... The Golden Compass, The Subtle Knife, and The Amber Spyglass. I have never read any of these books before either. Yeah, they're like young adult kids books, maybe? I'm not entirely sure. There's a whole HBO series based off of it, which I started to watch but never finished. And I never read these, and I thought, hmm, maybe I'm a little bit too old to be reading kids books. <laughs> you know, but with how famous and how well beloved his dark materials is i decided i'm never too old to read anything right so i attempted it and well i succeeded i mean i finished all three of them but i might have i don't know how to explain my experience with this trilogy the golden compass was really good i thought it was quite quite entertaining quite good i thought the world development everything about the development was quite good and i would say as an all in all over overall score it was probably like 7.5 of a book um it really started to fall apart for me personally around the subtle knife and plot wise i think it was fine um plot wise it was quite good actually maybe the first one was more than more like an eight and i think it's hilariously ironic that the book title is called the subtle knife because he has some messaging in here. And his messaging, the message that he's trying to convey, is anything but subtle. There is literally no subtlety in anything he's trying to convey here. So any, any title of any book in this having the word subtle in it was hilariously ironic. I, I don't know if he did that on purpose, like, this is my subtle message, because it's not. It's like being beaten over the head with a hammer. It is so not subtle what he's trying to say here. And I don't have anything wrong with what he's trying to say. I don't care. His, it's, this is a book about anti-religion. 
about as anti-religion as it will ever get. No wonder religious parents like boycotted and tried to have this book banned because it's a kid's book. He wants your child to read this book about killing God and being anti-religion. And once again, I want to repeat, I'm not some religious fanatic that was deeply offended by his messaging. Actually, I would have probably loved the messaging in this when I was younger, probably about the age of like 17, 18, 19. I would have really, that would have hit home hard with me. Some of the the things that he's really trying to write. When I was angsty and young, I would have really connected with this material. So I am a little bit late to the boat in that regard. But I'm older now, and I feel like that angsty part of my life has, I've left that behind. So maybe he was writing to that age group, or maybe he's just still angsty himself, or at least was at the time of writing this, and hadn't quite just <sighs> breathed that sigh of relief that he kind of really should. Like, take a, take a breath, dude. It's not... Not that bad. It'll be okay, I promise. But, <laughs> but, but plot-wise, they were fine. And messaging-wise, they were fine. I think the message was fine. I think the plot was fine. I think everything about these was just fine. If anything, I felt like the subtext was just so heavy-handed that it kept distracting me from the story itself. That's, I guess that's where I'm getting at. What I'm getting at here is... The subtext was so overpoweringly in your face that I couldn't focus on the actual story and the characters and what I felt like I was supposed to be focusing on for these books. So when it came to The Subtle Knife and The Amber Spyglass, I think I'm going to drop those down. They'll probably end up being right around a six, I don't know, something in that ballpark, above average, but... They could have been much, much, much better if he would have dialed the subtext back a little bit and not, not been so heavy-handed with it. Anyway, not bad. Not great, not bad. Now, last but not least, oh, God. Musashi. I am now in the official preparation for Vagabond. I put up a poll on my channel as to what people thought I should read next. People decided that they wanted me to read Vagabond, which is right down there. Now, in preparation for reading Vagabond, I decided to read Musashi. I didn't realize how long this book was. I can normally read a book in about a week. I've been working on this thing for two weeks now, and I'm like 100 or 786 pages into a thousand page book. I still have like 250 pages to go and these pages like you think a thousand page book that's I mean it's a big book but I've got other thousand page books on the shelf over here that I can read right no these things are like this is like the bible this is like these pages are like see-through they're so thin and then they're like the amount of words packed on this is a beast it doesn't look like the biggest book in the world but I'm telling you, I've been working on this thing for two weeks. And I'm only 700 and some pages into it. Oh my God. Anyway, it's long is what I'm getting at. And I don't really have the ability to rate this one yet. I don't have an overall. I'm not going to give an overall rating for it because I haven't finished it. Um, but what I can say is this is a delightful read. I did not ex I didn't know what to expect from a book written in the 19 what 20s in Japan and um, I will say it is a little dry at times and I would say that's probably a combination of the fact that it's translated from another language into ours can kind of cause a little bit of a disconnect sometimes and the fact that it's just written back in like the 1920s and language was not the same back then. They didn't write things for style and flavor and flair all the time. Sometimes they were just writing and that's fine. Read some old timey books that were not translated from Japanese. You'd be like, whoa, this is different, isn't it? So it can be a little dry, I guess is what I'm saying. But other than that, it's fascinating. And there are some wonderful characters in here uh, that I'm 
quite excited to see translated into the manga. Like, uh, what's his name? Is his name Takuan? Is it Takuan? Oh my god. Oh, he's pr he's by far my favorite character in this entire book. If he's not the greatest character in the manga, I will be sad. From what I understand, the characterizations from the book are extremely different from the characterizations in the manga. So I will just kind of have to see where where he takes us with that one and how it um, compares or holds up or whatnot. But I did want to do my homework so I would be able to go into that. If I went into Berserk completely blind, I kind of want to go into Vagabond the opposite. If I went into Berserk completely blind, blind meaning I'd never read manga before. I had no idea what I was in for and I didn't know the story. So I was blind blind, double blind. In this one, I have now read manga so I know what to expect from that genre and I want to have the source material under my belt so I will go in double, not blind. What's the, what's the opposite of double blind? Double vision! I will be drunk out of my mind because I'll be seeing everything in double vision. No, but seriously, I wanted the opposite. I wanted a different experience with Vagabond, and I wanted to go into this one more prepared than I went into Berserk. So that's why I'm reading Musashi. I also have The Book of Five Rings. But I have not read it yet, so I really can't put it on this list. I don't know why I even just got it. So anyway, that's what I read this year. If you somehow made it all the way to the end here, I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>